Hello, everybody. Good morning. This is Charlene Campbell, and I'm here. It's really sunny and bright this morning in my room here. The sun is just going to go up above the window in a few minutes, but here I am um, to do my live today. And a beautiful sun is on top of me here from outside. It feels good. I hope you're well, everybody. Um, I've got a good lineup for us today. We're going to talk about the guidelines for water birth. We're going to talk about um, how to know you, when you're in labor and what to do when your water breaks. I'm going to do the skill test that I said I would do, but I, I uh, forgot on the last one. So I'm going to talk about hidden abuse and how we can heal from it. And I'm going to do a healing visualization for us. I'm going to talk about transport guideline, the Washington State Transport Guideline. The one I found is from 2011, so it isn't it isn't fully updated, but I think we'll still learn from that. Um, and then we're going to do some healing affirmations, and I'm going to review some more sanitation kits. Hope you're well, everybody. I've got my three different um, chimes here today. I just want to show you my bells or my um, bowls. So this is the small bowl. So I like the sound of that one. And then I'll show you I'll show you different uh, bowls. I have three here, but I'll show you different ones throughout today. So um, I also want to say, I talked about saying some Brene Brown quotes in my last um, video, and um, I, I forgot <laughs> again. <laughs> and now the slip of paper that I had them on, I seem to have misplaced it, but I have one here that I found. And uh, I wrote here in my own words, I wrote, her words have provided guidance and insight to me, that's Brene Brown, countless of times, and I hope they will do the same for you. And then here's, here's the quote that I have. Vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. So how's everybody doing today? Welcome to Call on the Midwife. It's Charlene, and we've got a lot of bright light here today. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing well today. We are. We have the eagles in the back, and they're actually, James showed me yesterday morning that they're building a nest. So what they do, they're so huge. They fly right over our land, right over where I'm standing, and it just, it just their wingspan is massive you know and they fly really low because they're right beside the house right beside the shop actually and anyways there's a female and a male and they're building their nest now for their spring um babies that they're going to lay and what they do is they take turns one eagle will go and get some stuff and bring it back for the nest then the other one will go and they'll take turns it's pretty cool <laughs> that's what's happening here in our yard <laughs> So here's our candle. So bright today. The light is amazing. I'm wearing my really pretty um, linen jumper. So it's 100% linen, this jumper. Just love it. It's, can't really see it with the light so bright, but yeah, I'm enjoying wearing natural fibers. Okay. Well, here we are at the beginning of our class today. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, and I'm Looking forward to having my friend April and James over for lunch and my other friends, Faelene and Rudy, who I work with. Faelene, I've worked with now for many, many years in our circle. And um, even though I'm going to be moving up north to build a place of refuge uh, that's more private for people for uh, long-term trauma recovery and birthing recovery or any kind of trauma recovery, um, but mostly for moms, birthing moms and childbearing moms, okay, and their families. But she's going to be staying here and doing the circles, and um, I'm going to be leaving my teepee with her, and I'm excited about that. So 
um, everything has a purpose and I know that everything is divine and divinely designed. I'm so grateful for that. And um, I'm just going to say a little prayer. I'm so grateful that I could be here, Father, Mother, and Jesus Christ, my beloved. Yeshua, my Savior, I love thee. I love Father, I love thee, and Mother, I love thee also. I thank all of you for this beautiful moment with the angels and the light and the sun and the beautiful white light and the golden light and the pink light and the yellow light and all the beautiful colors of reflective light that come from the sun and from the beautiful full moon we had last night that was so glorious and lovely and radiant and healing and cleansing and purifying. And bless us that we will be purified by the light of thy love, that we will be purified by the light of thy peace and of thy truth, and that we will be in alignment with thy will and thy laws and thy love and thy purpose for us. And that this class, I dedicate this class to thee and to my purpose as a uh, messenger of truth, as a messenger of light for those who are interested in being servants to thee and to thy beloved children on the earth in these troubled times ahead and now, that we will be able to minister to those who are in their childbearing years, whether pregnant, whether birthing, or whether postpartum with an infant, that we will have a great compassion, that we will be able to have what the definition of compassion is shared suffering, where we can literally feel when other people are in pain, we do not, we don't become their rescuers in an unhealthy way, or we don't become their persecutors or their, you know, we don't ignore them, but we, we minister to them in healthy, loving, godly, practical, um, supportive ways for their healing and for their um, being retrieved from any abusive situations for any children that are with abusive parent and the other parent is being smeared. I call forth a healing. I command all barriers and bonds to be removed, especially trauma bonds from anyone listening to this call who's in a trauma bond that's unhealthy, that's keeping them in an unhealthy place, that they will be released from that barrier and that they will be able to move forth with faith, strength, trust, understanding of their purpose, understanding of their mission, understanding of God's love for them and of their ability to separate themselves from the behaviors, especially the disordered behaviors of others that are often unconscious or from childhood trauma and so deeply embedded that they are not something you can really work with very well and it's best to just move along and take care of yourself in the best way possible and i ask for the holy spirit to be here that anyone who is being abused in any way um, will have the ability to wake up from their own part in it if they are enabling if they are codependent if they are um in a victimhood or helpless role that they've taken on from childhood trauma or whatever it is, that they will be able to be freed from this and we command any darkness or anything of the sort to be removed and for the light of love to fill our hearts and fill this day and fill this class and fill this venue for teaching and learning that we might be able to be of practical and spiritually guided assistance in a calm, supportive, uh, godly way that is inspired and intuitive and authentic and helps to validate the mothers and helps them to process emotions that are difficult rather than stuffing them down, which causes only more issues and polarized behaviors and acting out. So help us to be emotionally intelligent humans and angels of light that we may know how to minister and have full sovereign authority over our own hearts and lives as we minister to others and encourage them to do the same and have a 
open heart and a loving soul, but a strong back that has clear and strong, healthy boundaries to protect and guard our peace from those who would cause us chaos. And bless them that they will be filled with peace eventually and be able to, if it's thy will and if they desire it to be healed, if they're disordered uh, behavioral issues that can develop from massive trauma in childhood. And bless us all that we will be present, authentic, vulnerable, and whole in every moment. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, I love to pray. I just, it just comes out what's supposed to be said. So there you go. That was very beautiful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Mother. Thank you. I just read a uh, a little excerpt by someone on Facebook about the mother and then the daughter being the Holy Ghost. Now, this is new. Most people don't believe this. Most people in any face that I know they don't even believe there's a daughter principle involved in the Godhead. But according to many of the scriptures and apocryphal writings where a lot of it got burned, you know, in Alexandria and different places, but there's very many stories where the Godhead is the father, the mother, the son, and the daughter. Doesn't that make sense when you think about how families are created? Mother, father, daughter, son. Anyway, it's just something to think about. All right, um, let's see. I've got my song, and then I'm going to get right into our guidelines for the use of water in labor and birth by the College of Midwives of British Columbia. Okay, and that's from my manual, which is, I think everybody knows my manual. I'll just show it to you. How are we all doing today? I'm happy to be here. Hope you're well. Hope you enjoy this. Um, I think you know my manual, so if you have it, you can follow along. We're going to be working on page 89, recommendations for use of water immersion, water immersion for labor and birth. <laughs> my glasses are turning into sunglasses because it's so bright. <laughs> okay, that's what we're going to do as soon as we're done the song. I'm just going to take a little drink. Cheers. Trying to get my water built up. I had an amazing week this week. Kevin and I had the opportunity to have some guests here who had children. And it was just so fun to spend time with young children. So healing. I've been estranged and I've lived far away from my children and my grandchildren for many years. It's been difficult, but it's basically because of my brain trauma. And that's what happens. About 100% of cases of people with my traumatic injury, they end up either, well, they end up without their family around them because you, you basically, your personality changes. It really does. You become highly reactive. Uh, it's really difficult, <laughs> but it teaches you like everything. It's part of our experience. So I picked a song that I felt I actually picked a different one. And then I was good. Then I felt prompted to sing this one, which I've already sung once before. I know, but I still feel like I'm supposed to sing it. Um, I could sing it with my drum, but I think I'm just going to sing it plain without my drum today. It'll be a little easier. <laughs> Okay, how are we all doing today? How are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. I've got the, see the light on the mother. My really, my daughter, my beautiful daughter, uh, Giselle. This is uh, her mother in law gave me that beautiful um, mother and baby Madonna. I really love it. Okay, so we're going to sing Give Yourself to Love by Kate Wolf. Does anybody know who Kate Wolf is? She's a, one of the olden days, um, you know, folk singers from the 80s and, and 90s, I think. Anyway, I really like her. Um, this is from 1982. 
Okay, Eddie, here we are. I'm going to sing a little song, then we'll get into our lesson. Thanks for joining me here on Call in the Midwife. Kind friends all gather round. There's something I would say that what brings us together here has blessed us all today. Love has made a circle that holds us all inside. Where strangers are as family and loneliness can't hide. So give yourself to love. Love is what you're after. Open up your heart to the tears and laughter and give yourself to love, give yourself to love. I've walked these mountains in the rain. I've learned to love the wind. I've been up before the sunrise to watch the day begin. I always knew I'd find you, though I never did know how. But like sunshine on a cloudy day, you stand before me now. So give yourselves to love. If love is what you're after, open up your hearts to the tears and laughter and give yourselves to love. Give yourselves to love. Love is born in fire, it's planted like a seed. Love can't give you everything, but it gives you what you need. Love comes when you're ready, love comes when you're afraid. It'll be your greatest teacher, the best friend you ever made. So give yourself to love. Love is what you're after. Open up your hearts to the tears and laughter and give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Oh, give yourselves to love. Give yourself to love. <laughs> okay, my really dear friend Harriet Grambois taught me that song. I think we sang it her blessingly that we had in Naramata, British Columbia, Canada for her fifth baby. We had it in a beautiful chapel where her husband had built this wood chapel. And it was just, it was like this gorgeously like Waldorf. She's a Waldorf teacher and the they have a lot of the, the archways and the roundness to their to his um, structures that he builds out of wood. He's an architect, and they're just amazing, the ground was. Anyway, she shared that song with me. So let's get into our guidelines for the use of water birth. I'm going to show you something just quickly. I wanted to kind of um, show a couple pictures that I collect that I find really beautiful. Basically what I believe is that because a lot of the information about the true divine feminine mother and daughter were basically lost, um, they had to be, imp 
embedded into some secret kind of way, which the way people normally share knowledge or pass knowledge down is through poetry, music, and art. And so one of the things that um, I love this woman, I think her name is Barbara Kippen. She's amazing. Um, my therapist that I had in Mexico when I was there, I had an amazing therapist and it's her sister, I believe, who does these collections and she collects the art from all over Europe. So I keep a, quite a big collection that I've printed off from her work. And then some are also from calendars that I like, um, but I'm just gonna show you a couple. Here's a really pretty one. Oh, well, it's, it's not necessarily pretty, but very in detail. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. The light is so bright today. It's a little bit hard to show stuff. But it's kind of a picture of heaven, you know, kind of interesting. And then this is one of when Mary was going to have, um, you know, Jesus Christ, that the Gabriel came to her and announced to her that she would give birth to the savior of the world. And that's such an amazing story that I think it's all over in so many places, that story. Okay, so we showed you a couple pictures, so let's go then. So we're on page 89 <laughs> for everybody. Sorry, the light is so different, but it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. I, I like that I'm getting some vitamin D. Um, I was, listening to someone today. And I remember we used to test every single pregnant mom. I always tested her vitamin D storage. Okay. And oftentimes she wasn't getting enough vitamin D. She didn't have enough vitamin D. Okay. Now this was in Seattle. So there's a lot of overcast days in Seattle and there's a lot of rainy days, but um, we often would have to supplement moms with vitamin D. Okay. And I was aware of this, but not, I was just reminded of it again, that um, a vitamin D deficiency, oh, that's a fly. A vitamin D deficiency can cause um, uh, infant defects. Okay. Infant um, anomalies. So it is important to get enough sunlight each day on your skin, directly on your skin. It's also important to check your levels and make sure that you're eating. You can get foods with high vitamin D. You can look online. Um, I have a handout. Maybe I'll go over that sometime. But um, eating high vitamin D foods, getting your sun and then also maintaining, checking your vitamin D levels periodically and then um, supplementing with um, a supplement if you're low. Because sometimes if you're really low, you need to build up your storage before, because just going out every day and getting your minimal requirement. There was one fly in here and I killed it. And now, sorry, I did, if that offends anyone, but I don't, it doesn't offend me, but I hope it doesn't offend you. But this fly is really annoying. Ask an angel to come and get it out of here for me, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to move on now. That's our little one. That's our medium one. That's our big one. All different sounds, eh? All different sounds. Okay. Welcome to Call on the Midwife. We're at 23 minutes. Getting into the meat of our lesson right now. Just got touched by an angel on my forehead, on my side of my head. Oh dear, this fly is kind of. <laughs> One time I had an inspiration about flies because I find them very pesky and not very nice. We left our doors open when the kids were here, though they were running in and out and in and out. So we don't normally have a lot of flies, but today we do. And it was worth it having the kids here. It really was. They were such a joy and such a blessing. But one of the things that came to my mind is that flies are like the, the spirit showed me one time that the opposition that we get, you know, the opposition of um, um, I believe part of it is our shadow side that has to be healed, which is all the shame and shadow and darkness and all of our sort of dysfunction. 
that we have to be able to see it and not be ashamed of it and be okay with healing it and moving along and being healed, you know? And, but there's also opposition out there, dark ones that know our mission and they're trying to thwart our mission. Okay. And he said to me one time, Christ, you know, whispered to my ear through the Holy spirit that they have about as much power as a fly bug in us right now. And that's the honest truth. So when we know our sovereign authority, we are really, we have sovereign authority over any other entities or darkness or familial spirits that are hounding us or anything like that. If you've got uh, anything that's frustrating you or, or causing you bad dreams or, you know, bad thoughts, definitely could be coming from something that you're not aware of, but make sure you use your power to cast it out. And I just saw an orb came out of me, <laughs> cast it out by the power of Jesus Christ. And in the name of God, cast out all familial spirits, all evil spirits and anything hounding me or the people watching this right now or this class. And I say this in Jesus name. Amen. So be it. So it is. We have to realize that that's the power we have. It's not that complicated, but once we know, then we are much more sovereign in our lives and uh, realize our place in the world is great with God. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Let's do this. Water birth. <laughs> I think water birth is a very popular way of having babies. I probably did probably 50% water births or more. You know, we did a ton of them. Okay, I'm just going to go through the list. <clears throat> Midwives should discuss the potential advantages and disadvantages of water immersion for labor and birth with each woman prior to labor. Yes. I think having a definite plan to have a place to get out to quickly, like I talked about having a rolled up bundle that you just unroll really quickly. And then when she gets out of the tub, she's got something to go to. She doesn't have to be you know, taken to another bed or something. The woman's vital signs and fetal heart rate must be within normal limits if mother's in the tub, period. Okay. And if they're not, she needs to get out. The fetal heart should be monitored according to acceptable guidelines. Use of a waterproof Doppler device is recommended. Yes. And Waterproof Dopplers run around $1,000, the really expensive ones that most midwives that I know and that I have. Now, these Dopplers, you want to make sure when you're holding a Doppler that you never hold the Doppler over the water. You always hold the Doppler outside of the tub, and then you just hold the wand in the inside the water, and the water conducts so you don't have to use gel. Okay. <clears throat> The water temperature should be monitored and should be maintained between 36 and 37.5 Celsius. And I would say on the cooler side of that is best, okay? To prevent hypo or hyperthermia. The temperature may, may be monitored by a floating thermometer. And we always had like a kit for the parents that included um, a brand new uh, fish scoop for the poop scoop that I talked about, a little bucket for that and then a, um, a floating thermometer. You can get floating thermometers. Uh, the woman's temperature should be monitored when she's in the tub more than normal. And she should leave the water if her temperature exceeds 37.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, right. The woman should be encouraged to maintain adequate hydration. I would say she needs to actually drink even a little bit more than what she would normally drink because you're sweating more in the tub. So making sure almost in between each contraction, she should be having something that's replenishing her water and fluid levels. Okay. And electrolytes. Don't forget about electrolytes. Broths without any MSG or yeast extract can be a good supplement to what I talked about before, which is the labor aid or the coconut milk. So you could add broths, uh, good quality broths that are not made with MSG, like I said, and be careful because yeast extract is the same thing. Alrighty, the woman should be encouraged to urinate 
regularly and she needs to leave the pool when she urinates. You know, I mean, if it's right before the birth and she pees in the pool, it's not going to be the end of the world, right? Because urine is actually um, sterile. Urine is, and it's not the worst thing in the world. There's a lot of cultures that use urine as a medicine because it has like the homeopathic version of exactly what you need for your own medicine. So if you ever need like homeopathic medicine, you can, um, you can take small amounts of urine and make them into a medicine. Okay. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, if you study Ayurvedic healing, it's kind of an interesting thing that I think they used it during the war in Germany and in some of the clinics there where they couldn't get medicine and they were having like the best success in the entire war place. The other thing they were, or, you know, the war hospitals, the other thing that they learned during the war, I think it was Germans, Germany or, can't remember who it was, but where they had these clinics might've been Switzerland and they used coffee enemas for pain and recovery. And they were, they were saving lives with these coffee enemas. They really were. So that's another thing that's interesting when you're in low resource conditions to know about those two things, I think is good. Okay, we'll keep going with the list. Thanks for coming along. Whoever's here with me, God bless you on your day. And happy Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> okay, here we are. The woman should be asked to leave the water if there are any concerns about her or her baby's well-being. Yes, and she needs to be willing to do that. So you talk to her about that ahead of time, that if anything goes outside of normal range or even slightly, we may ask you to leave the tub. So don't get too attached or don't help a mom not to get too attached to this rigid idea of where she's going to have her baby. Cause we need to kind of go with the flow with birth. Cause sometimes it takes us in way, in places we don't, we can't anticipate, but we have to trust birth and trust that we can Whoops, it says I'm currently signed out. This wants me to sign into my studio. Oh dear. Uh, do this, I don't know why. Hopefully I'm still on here. Okay, it made me sign into my password. That's crazy. <laughs> Okie dokie, here we are. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, I have a cute little thing I'm going to show you. Everybody deserves a midwife. It's a bumper sticker. I never put it up on my car, but I got it at a midwife free conference. Okay. Where are we at now? Let's keep going. The water should be kept as clean as possible. Stool and blood clots must be removed from the tub immediately. An alternative place should be set up close to the pool. Yes, I talked about that muchly in the other videos, but it's <laughs> so important to have a place to go if you're doing a water birth and to be willing to leave the tub. Um, the tub should be drained, cleaned, and refilled if the pool is being used over a number of hours or if contaminants cannot be easily removed. And don't forget to use a liner if you're doing a water birth. You should be using a liner if you have one. Okay. Or if someone else is going to use that tub later, then the liner can be thrown away. Or you can actually wash some of those big, thick liners and reuse them. Okay. I think it depends on how high of resources we have. I really think water birth would be a luxury in a low resource setting. You, you probably would just do a land birth. <laughs> if you, unless you're in a very unusual situation and you had like, higher resources and maybe the woman really needed the pain relief because um, water can really be a huge, probably 50% pain reduction and maybe, you know, 25 to 50% pressure reduction on at pushing. So that's something that, you know, moms can really benefit from if they're having a hard time relaxing is the water. All right. Let's keep going. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Colin, the midwife. Hope you're all well. We're doing well here. All right. 
The baby should be born completely under water. I've talked about this before. If the mom is partly out of the water or the water's too shallow, that can be uh, a hazard to the birth going smoothly for baby. The mother should be completely immersed under the water or she be, should be completely out one or the other, okay? And um, at the birth, the baby's head must be brought to the surface immediately. Yes. You don't want to stimulate the baby's breathing, which could lead to water aspiration. If the baby's partly out of the water, that could stimulate the baby's breathing. But if the baby's in the water, it's just like they're transitioning from water to water. So it's not, it, it doesn't shock them. It just, it's kind of very gradual. And then as they come out, they're ready to breathe. And we don't leave them under the water at all. If you ever see a video like that, where they're leaving them under the water for long periods of time, I've seen that. I've seen people do that. I've actually been to births like that, where they don't pull them up right away. I've never seen a baby aspirate water under there. It's basically they're in the water or they're out of the water. Once they get out, they start breathing. And when they're in the water, they don't breathe. They're just attached to the cord. But I personally think you should bring the baby out of the water immediately. It's best not to pull the baby up with, like, say if the baby's under the water like this, okay? And this is the water. Sorry, I want to give you a little demo on this. If the water's here and the baby's here, it's best to help the baby turn under the water and be pulled up. I'll show you what I mean. So say, say this is the baby. Mom's just had her baby. Here's the water right here. We can see baby's face. Baby's fully underwater. Baby's doing fine because baby's not going to start breathing unless baby's up in, in the air, okay? And baby's fully immersed under the water. So what we're going to do is we're just going to gently, cord's not wrapped. We can see cord's not wrapped. We're just going to gently help baby roll this way, and we're going to pull the baby up this way. So we're not pulling the baby straight up this way. If you do, don't worry about it. Babies are usually fine. But if you pull the baby straight up this way, then any water that's in their nasal passages or their mouth is could get aspirated as you're pulling them up. It doesn't usually happen, but I find it if you pull them up this way, then they're basically in a postural drainage position right at the beginning, and then they can go to mom, but they're not going to be, um, they're going to be able to breathe better if they don't have that water in there. Okay. All right. I keep going. Thanks for joining me, Charlene here and call them the midwife. All right. Feeling a lot better <laughs> this week. I think it was just a week of mercies. <laughs> Tons of beautiful people came by. <laughs> My friends from Canada came and visited. It was just one of those good weeks. I want to do something different for a minute, just to give that a little break. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, just give you a couple of quotes, okay? Here's a really neat little quote that I like. Pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Proverbs 16, 24. And here's another one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble a very present help in trouble psalm 46 1 Okay, I'm just going to read this one little quote. One of the things that's been on my mind quite a bit is relationships. I just feel like it's everywhere. Everywhere I turn with all the women that I work with, different women that I've worked with over the last few years and even over the last few months, having difficulty in their relationships causing 
a lot of stress for them, whether it's in their pregnancies, after their birth, or whenever. So just to help us educate ourselves, um, a nice guy will blame others' circumstances or fate for his lot in life. A good man recognizes his role in whatever has transpired, takes responsibility, and when necessary, redirects his course. A nice guy wants to play the knight in shining armor, but is quick to disappear when S-H-I-T gets real. <laughs> Let's be honest, sometimes that's true. A good man knows it's not his job to rescue anyone, but will show up and have your back when needed. Wow, cool. Okay, a nice guy will discard anything and anyone that is no longer useful to him. I wouldn't say that's a nice guy personally, but that's just the way this little thing was written. It says, are you a nice guy or a good man? <laughs> And then the opposite to that is a good man will respect another person's inherent dignity and treat them kindly, even when they no longer have a role or purpose in his life plan. Yes. Mm. That was almost high. Yeah, it's higher. The lowest, the littlest one is the highest. The medium one is the medium size, and then the big one is the lowest. Okay, we're about halfway through. We're going to keep going. Recommendations for the use of water immersion for labor by the um, guidelines by um, the College of Midwives of British Columbia, CMBC. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the birth, the baby's head must be brought to the surface immediately. Yes, so we just talked about that. Care should be taken to avoid undue traction on the cord. There have been reports of cord tearing. I have seen, I have witnessed cord tearing in a bathtub. Well, I'll tell you why it tore, okay? Well, we were having a face presentation, which I think made it worse. I think you could have more cord tearing with a face presentation or a short cord or a combination of both of those. But one of the things to guard over is this is what the midwife did, okay? This is what she did. She was a little anxious because the baby was coming down like this with her face presenting, okay? She didn't know that, but the birth was taking for a, quite a long time. Um, but finally, when the baby finally started to come, she realized that the baby was face, okay? And I think she, her adrenaline pumped quite a bit. Instead of just kind of letting the baby come up and giving the baby time to, you don't have to just go boom out of the water like that. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Let the baby come out. It's not like a panic to get them to the surface. It's just let them come up. If the cord's wrapped, that's the time to unwrap underwater. If you if you pull them up and they're and they're still wrapped, that's okay. Unwrap above water. Mom might have to get up a little bit so you have enough room to unwrap. Okay. Now, what she did though is this: she got so kind of wired. I think from the shock of this presentation was quite unusual, but I don't think she had intended to do it. But she pulled the baby up quickly now the baby was like this on the mother okay and we realized that the baby needed resuscitation so she decided to just do it right there so she was doing the ambu bag but nothing was happening it wasn't working and I was the assistant at this birth. It wasn't my primary client, but I was doing some births as I was preparing to be licensed in um, Seattle, but I had already been working for many years in Canada, both before licensure and during licensure as an approved second midwife. So I... 
I was there. Okay. And what happened was I just had this feeling. Well, I reached down and we only had about a stump this big of cord there. It had ripped off fully and was bleeding out. So I grabbed it. I could barely get enough to hold. I got just enough to hold the cord stump so it wouldn't be bleeding. And we were able to get a cord clamp on it and do resuscitation on the baby. The baby actually was, because of the face presentation, we had to call in a um, cranial sacral chiropractor to come and do adjustments on the baby for several days in a row before the baby had proper kind of neck control. Baby's neck was really wobbly from that presentation. Okay, let's keep moving. Here we are. <laughs> the light's not as bright right now, but I hope you can see me now. <laughs> All right. Some authors recommend early clamping of the cord to prevent polycythemia and reduce the risk of fetal blood loss if the cord integrity is compromised. I disagree with that. This is revised in 2010. We don't do early cord cutting anymore, pretty much for any baby, because they need their full blood volume, which is between 40 to 45 or more percent of it is actually in the placenta at the time of the delivery. So keep the cord attached is what I would say. And that um, polycythemia from leaving the cord attached or hyperbilirubinemia or any of those issues are just not, um, they're not to warrant cutting the cord. They are natural physiological um, processes that will resolve. Okay. All right. With proper care with the, you know, with the bilirubin, if the baby's yellow, that's another thing to, to talk about the light, the sunlight, getting indirect sunlight on the baby's skin, 20 minutes, three times a day will reduce, not in the baby's eyes, but just on the baby's front and back. 10 minutes on each side through a window indirectly even will help that baby to process the bilirubin like that. And then of course, breastfeeding on demand also helps with that. Okay. All right, let's move on. <laughs> uh, so care should be taken to maintain the newborn's temperature to prevent hypothermia. Yes, we talked about keeping the baby warm. And I think getting the baby out of the tub fairly promptly after and drying the mother and baby off and getting the mother flat on her back so you can assess bleeding properly. And even if she hasn't had the placenta, she can still push her placenta out either flat on her back, or at some point, she can just squat up and push it out if she's, if she's having a contraction, and she knows she's getting that sense of urgency to push. Some in the hospital, they'll just like pull the placenta out. I really believe that it's better to have the mothers in a more autonomous position with their placentas, that they're in charge of pushing the placenta out. You could help guide the placenta out with gentle core traction, but not pulling it out like in the hospital. That's an invasive practice. That's not part of midwifery model of care in my personal um Feeling, I have seen certified nurse midwives do it, even at home births, but it's not the way I was taught and it's not the way I teach others. Okay. Care should be taken, yes, to not have undue traction on the cord. And uh, yes, the placenta is best delivered outside of the tub to accurately assess maternal bleeding because that's when you're going to be doing the assessment of maternal bleeding is right after. I mean, you'll be assessing it right after the birth, but you'll also be checking the uterus and the introitus for any visual signs of bleeding immediately after the delivery of the placenta. That's part of your job. Okay. If you're at a birth and you're helping a mom is to make sure that her uterus is like a hard grapefruit centrally located just beneath her umbilical 
or her um, belly button and above her pubic bone. Okay, that's where it should be located. And it's a round, hard grapefruit. You can teach her to massage it and make sure she knows how to take care of herself and go to the bathroom, urinate if it's hard because urinating um, can help relieve the pressure on the uterus that can cause it to bleed. If you have a full bladder, that can be a hindrance to uh, the uterus clamping down like a hard grapefruit. Okay. So birth pools that are being used in the hospital or that will be used again by another birthing mother should be cleaned between uses with chlorine releasing agents to kill any bloodborne pathogens. As when caring for any mother or newborn, the midwife is responsible for using her clinical judgment, responding appropriately to problems that may arise and for documenting your actions. Yes. Okay. Well, that's a really neat outline of how to best care for moms in water it doesn't really talk about all the amazing benefits of the water <laughs> which are many and not a few you know for most moms they really like the water so sometimes it's worth it you know for all the work that you have to do to make it happen okay we've got our how to know you are in labor that's what's next Okay, how to know you're in labor. I've got this cute little handout from my beloved dear midwife, Callie Leslie, registered midwife, who used to be a midwife at Lakelands Midwifery in Cologne. I believe she's probably retired. I'm pretty sure she is. But she had this cute little quarter page size handout that she'd give her midwifery clients when they were getting ready to be due. I really like it because it's it, it helps the primips, which are the first time moms, to know when to call the midwife, when to page the midwife, okay? So she says, primips with no previous births. This is your instructions. Three. So this is, the numbers are three, two, one. You see that? Three, two, one. <laughs> Here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> Bless the... <laughs> uh, okay, three. Contractions are three minutes apart. From the start of one to the start of the next, three minutes apart. Two, number two. The pattern has been like this for approximately two hours. Three minutes apart for two hours. This is the first time, Mom, okay? And number one, contractions are lasting one minute long from the start of one to its completion. If your water breaks, is the baby moving? These are the questions you wanna say. If your water breaks, is baby moving? Is water clear? Those are the two questions, okay? If you have flecks of white with clear to weak color, it's considered clear and normal. Green or brown should re be reported to the midwife immediately as that can be meconium, okay? And um, there, that's, that's, that's that. <laughs> okay. When your water breaks, okay, I'm just going to do a quick, that kind of goes along with what we just did when your water breaks, all right? A little bit more in depth of when your water breaks. This is a sign I made for myself. I really like take joy. And I'm really trying to practice that taking joy in everything, even if it's not happy, even the, the grief or the, the loss or the sadness or the disappointments that I'm taking joy in absolutely everything. Because I know I'm learning from everything that I'm going through. And um, I'm sure you are too. We're all going through things. I think everybody is going through transitions right now. Everyone that I know is of some kind, whether it's with their children, with themselves, with their partners. So anyway, I'm doing really well and I'm really happy, happy that I am healing. And thank you for this opportunity to share because I feel like it heals me to do this. <laughs> thank you for watching. Thank you for caring. Okay, bloody show. How do you know you're you're um, you're in labor? Okay, we're gonna go through a couple more things here. This is from my handout: um, bloody show or loss of mucus plug, 
spotting of blood or thick or and or thick stringy mucus from the vagina or the yoni, okay? Or the introitus, whatever you want to call it. Um, some people don't like to use a vagina because it means sheath for the sword. And then yoni has, I think, a more supposedly better meaning than that. I don't know. It's from the Indian or Ayurvedic philosophy. I'm fine with either one personally because it's just a term to me. Um, number two, your water breaks. That's another way your labor can start, okay? Or you have labor such as low back pain or abdominal cramping or spotting, okay? If your water is not clear in color or has an odor, call the midwife or doctor immediately. If it's clear and odorless, then do the following. Now, here I have call the midwife if, if contractions are three to four minutes, pretty similar to Callias, okay? These could vary just slightly on the midwife's preference. But this is for first-time mom again. With a second-time mom or a mom that's had lots of babies, sometimes she doesn't have as much warning. You just have to go by whatever she says mostly is like, I need you to come and you go, you know, because she might not have the warning time. So always be ready to come if the mom says that you should come, especially if she's not a first-time mom and trust her, trust her words. If she believes she needs you, then trust that. Um, I think it helps to build up a really good trusting relationship during pregnancy. If you're, uh, if you are a midwife working with someone as a client um, so that, you know, you have that confidence built up in her that she's not afraid to tell you if she needs help and she won't be timid about asking you for help if she needs it. Okay. And then again, sometimes moms can be so finicky and not prepared that they, call you before they're really ready and you have to spend time on the phone talking to them and finding out what's going on. And if they're not really in true, uh, what I would call active labor, then they need to, um, it's best if the midwife, statistically it's best if they do not go to the hospital or call the midwife at that time. They will have a better outcome and a less chance of a cesarean, less chance of intervention if they do that. And that's statistically, scientifically, well, in studies it's proven, okay? So contractions lasting 60 seconds or greater and or if you just feel you should call. That's the other caveat, if you just feel you should call. If you are past 37 weeks and your water breaks during the night but you have no contractions or it's early labor and water is clear, you do not need to call. Drink fluids, try to sleep or rest so that you have energy when labor gets stronger or when contractions begin again and call the midwife to report in the morning. If your water breaks, here we are, if your water breaks, put nothing in the vagina, no tampons, no sex, no intercourse, no fingers, do not check your cervix if your water is broken, okay? No bathtubs, showers are fine, okay? And note the time that your water broke as well. Practice good hygiene, wipe from front to back, um, after urinating or BM, change your pad regularly, wash your hands before using the toilet, take your temperature when your water breaks, and every two to four hours thereafter. Uh, make sure you stay well hydrated and nourished, okay? And let the midwife know if your temperature ever goes above 100.4 Fahrenheit, okay? Drink plenty of water and eat nutritious foods and keep your energy up and rest. Okay, that's that. There we go. Okay, now this is something I said I was gonna do. I said I was gonna do a little pop quiz and on level one midwifery care, but I didn't get around to it last time. I kind of forgot. So here I am. I'm gonna give you a little pop quiz. You ready? <laughs> You may not know the answer, but that's okay. It's a nice picture I was going to show last time too, and I forgot. There, I like this um, artist a lot. 
Her name is. Goodness me, what is her name? I'm sorry. I don't see the name of the artist on the back of this, but it is a very beautiful painting, isn't it? It's the depiction of Christ giving us a handout. Okay. Okay, okay. The skills, that's what I mean. Here it is. You ready? <laughs> okay. These, the answer to these questions are actually, oopsie, the action, answer to these questions are in these videos, are in these videos there. These are the videos that I use in the course and um, so if you have those videos, you might know the answers if you've watched them. Okay, we're just going to go through. I'm going to do about one page of questions, okay? What is the main purpose of the maternal physical exam? Okay, here's the answers. To diagnose breast cancer, to determine if a woman's pelvis or body is adequate for vaginal birth, to determine from findings which health specialist to refer the client to, or to establish a baseline of health condition of that particular woman. Which one do you think it is? Number four, to establish a baseline of the health condition of that particular woman. Yes, that's what the main pur purpose of a maternal physical exam is in early pregnancy when you're establishing care in midwifery care, okay? which I really believe is an important part of midwifery care, is knowing how to do well women care, uh, um, examinations, and um, PAPs, and all those things, okay? Number two, why is it important to identify and treat low-grade bacterial infections in early pregnancy? To prevent the bacteria from taking over the thyroid, leading to hypothyroidism, to clear it out before it causes an autoimmune disease. Prompt and effective treatment of this infection in early pregnancy can reduce the risk later in pregnancy of preterm labor. To prevent preeclampsia from developing. Okay, which number do you think? One, two, three, or four is the answer. Number three is the answer. Prompt and effective treatment of this infection in early pregnancy, such as low-grade UTIs. That's why we always do a culture. We always do a culture on UTIs, and we always make sure that we grow a culture so that if she has a low-grade UTI, we can be very specific with the antibiotic therapy that she's going to be treated with it. We'll usually refer her to a physician or a nurse practitioner for that prescription. Or sometimes they will work with natural therapies and then we'll retest depending on the mother. Okay. But usually we go for the full antibiotic therapy because it can prevent preterm labor. And I have seen things like untreated low grade uh, strep infections in the bladder in early pregnancy can lead to premature labor and birth. It could be a really big issue. That's why it's so important to do the proper cultures of urine and not just to ignore it if it's a if it's got a low grade infection that is needs to be treated low grade urinary tract infection. Praise God for the fly that's here. <laughs> I'm taking joy. No, I'm just kidding. I don't like flies. But anyways, it's not can't be helped right now. I'm not gonna. Uh... Sorry. <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Best. It's because there's so many cows around here. Like we have cows, fields of cows, fields of horses. The flies. Are kind of obnoxious in there. 
You don't have a lot of boundaries. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. I think we're just going to do one more. Actually, we're going to do two more. We're going to do five all together. You ready? What are ways you can help liaison support for the mother to care for her spine health in pregnancy and help reduce malposition issues? Ooh. Refer her to someone who does pel the pelvic twist maneuver. Hire a chiropractor to come to prenatal appointments and adjust the fifth metatarsal bone. Refer the client to an aromatherapist. Identify deviations and refer to chiropractor, physical, physiotherapy, or massage. What number do you think it is? <laughs> number four again. <laughs> Identify deviations and refer to chiropractor, physical therapy, or massage. That could really help if you do a spinal exam and you check her waist. Check if she's got like one side is higher than the other. If she's got like curvature to her spine, any of that stuff could affect her baby's positioning. Okay, so she needs to get an adjustment and keep that alignment through whatever method is best for her and she can decide, but you can help her get the referral. Oh my goodness, I'm suddenly warm. <laughs> okay, so you can see my outfit better now. This is my really pretty little dress, you see? It's a jumper and it's um, it's made out of um, linen. I love linen. I do, I've got my big pockets. It's really pretty. Okay. I'm just going to take my sweater and put it over there. There we go. <laughs> All right, there we are. How's everybody doing today? I'm doing good. It was just fun to be around children for three days in a row. I got to be around these little sweet little people. <laughs> I think I'm more like a child than an adult. I actually get along with kids better than I get along with adults. Since my brain trauma, for sure I do. <laughs> All right, here's another one I want to share. Somebody shared this with me. I don't know who it was, but it might have been Zoe Bartholomew, my buddy from Logan. God's voice. This is what God's voice does, okay? This is how you can tell the difference between God's voice and a voice of darkness. God's voice stills you, encourages you, leads you reassures you, calms you, convicts you, and enlightens you. Any other voice that is not coming from our Father and Mother in Heaven, is it rushes you, pushes you, frightens you, I would say manipulates you, cajoles you, tries to convince you, tries to um, invalidate your perceptions, tries to make you doubt yourself, discourages you, condemns you, and confuses you. Yeah, here's another picture that I, I like to collect these old pictures. I find I just find them really peaceful to look at. Okay. We have one more question to do on our midwifery skills test that I created for my level one. You can actually take this class, but I'm going to be putting it up online here in the U.S. It's in the U.K. right now, but I'm going to be making a new website for it soon. Okay, number five. And this goes along with what I talked about today, which is the vitamin D. Um, what is the lab test to identify if a pregnant mother has enough stored, stored vitamin D to help grow the baby optimally. Vitamin D is important for growing your baby optimally, okay? And here's some answers. D5-hydroxylate, DD, DD monohydroxy, vitamin D hydroxy 25, and D4 level testing. Which one is it? One, two, three, or four. Number three is the answer. Vitamin D hydroxy 25 is the test. Okay. 
Done. Very good. You passed. <laughs> you all passed. <laughs> okay. Now, I just want to show you quickly this book that um, really helped from a lot of subtle psychological abuse that I had been experiencing for pretty much my whole life and a lot of people. <laughs> this woman did research all over the world in domestic abuse and basically found that the abusers always use the eight, the same eight traits. I'm not saying that the person who's being abused or is a victim of the abuse doesn't have a role that they're playing either by being a victim or feeling helpless not having the power to say no or whatever it is, but there still nonetheless is a lot of psychological hidden abuse. And there's eight traits that they use and they're all the same traits in every country, in every language, in every religion, in every tradition. So, you know, these traits don't come from God. <laughs> they don't come from man either because they're all the same always. So they're just, they're a way that people are manipulated into doing things that are not good basically to each other. Okay. So we'll just take a quote out of here. I'm just, I'm literally randomly opening it to page 37. Okay. Psychologically abusive leaders. Now, this can be really prevalent in churches, religious institutions. Huge, huge. Psychologically abusive leaders can be so well insulated by yes men and yes women, I'd call them their flying monkeys, <laughs> um, that to be questioned, that's why so much abuse in the LDS church, in the Catholic church, in every church that I've ever known of, is basically covered up by the leaders and the establishment. It is. I have personal experience with this here in my own congregation. I literally was in a choir here like two years ago. All these young women are singing with us. And I'm sitting, I'm standing right beside the leadership, supposedly leadership, the bishop and his two counselors in the LDS church, okay? I've been in the LDS church for 43 years and a half. And I'm pretty disillusioned with a lot of the things I've seen in the church, actually, but not saying there isn't some goodness there, but there's a lot of corruption. And so I'm, I'm singing in the choir. This young woman who has this very thin skirt is black, and she's kind of heavy, but somehow it got caught in her butt crack. <laughs> and this guy, instead of looking away, she's literally standing right in front of him with her butt there. And nobody can see him because she's in front of him, and everybody's staring straight ahead, but I've got a side view to this guy. And through the entire hour meeting, every time she stood up, he was Googling her butt. Like, it was very, very, very disturbing. I wrote a letter to the bishop at the time, which is my previous bishop. I wrote a letter to the current bishop, and I sent copies to the state president. about. I, I requested that he not be allowed to be alone in a room with any young women because of what I saw. And they just ignored my letter, didn't even respond. The guy's still in leadership positions. They didn't care. The, their exact words to me were, he's such a good man, he would never do that. Speaking as a person who's been sexually molested for years of my life, and I know literally thousands of women who have been, I think it's like one out of two women will be molested. Uh it's very common for people to deny abuse, to protect abusers, to literally um, invalidate any possibility that a person could have done it, or the you know the the um, the truth, basically denying the truth. Uh, 
I'm going to read this again. Psychologically abusive leaders can be so well insulated by yes men and yes women. So the bishop was the yes man for this man in this case. And then it became the stake president and the other bishop were all yes men um, for an abuser, a voyeur. I think it would be voyeurism, I would call it. That to be questioned about their actions comes as a rude awakening. And of course, they can never acknowledge anything because a lot of them are narcissistic, which means they have zero compassion, zero empathy, zero capacity to self-reflect and zero capacity to change anything about themselves because they have such a grandiose idea of themselves that they're incapable of it. Literally. Um, the individuals and couples who dare to stand up, like me, will be shunned out of the congregation community, the larger congregation or administration staff, the more active criticism or exposure for abusive behaviors. This woman did uh, like a lifetime of research and she went into all the churches and institutions and she did all this research. It's the same eight traits that they use in the leadership of institutions to perpetuate abuse. Okay, wanted to let you know about that. Now, we have our healing visualization is on the list next. That'd be good since I'm talking about that other stuff. It's a bit depressing. Look at this little cutie. Yes, the pioneers, they did not cut the cord. They would just wrap the placenta up with the baby. Help the mother. Help the mother to squat over a bowl or bucket to deliver her placenta. She may also push it out while lying down. Yes, we discussed this. Clots and blood will come out with the placenta, and that's normal, and it's okay. Wrap it in newspapers, or if you have one, a large four-quart Ziploc freezer ba plastic bag for the placenta. We usually carry two in each of our kits. Help clean mother up somewhat with a clean cloth or wipes. Help position the baby between the mother's breasts on her tummy, skin to skin, with blankets or towels. Okay. We talked a lot about the pause and not being rushing from first stage to second stage of labor, but letting the mother have a pause. The rhythm of labor changes. This is called the rest and be thankful stage or the pause. Okay, so what happens? The rhythm of labor changes the progression of the very, from the very intense time of labor and contractions have been strong, frequent and long right before that. The mother has been working hard. There is often a pause for the mother, a time for the body to rest from the hard work of labor and prepare by allowing the baby to descend into the pelvis naturally. Yes, this is so important for allowing the baby to descend naturally. It really, it shortens the second stage. It shortens all the, the pushing and everything because um, you're working with the body. And then, um, I love this picture. It just shows so well how supportive a team of um, amazing doula, midwife, friend, partner can be. Strongly encourage the mom to wait before, for the urge to push before she starts actively pushing. Heaven's hormonal blessing is doing its wonder. Mothers may not notice the contractions have taken a pause. The intrinsic intelligence of the human body knows when it needs a break. The body's wisdom is a marvelous thing. Okay. All righty. Next is the healing visualization. How are we doing for time? 119. 911 backwards. <laughs> That's a pay attention number for me too. All right. Healing visualization. What are we going to do? I'd like to do a couple. Um, where is it now? So I thought I had a couple of affirmations here I was going to do with you. 
Oh well, guess we're not doing that. <laughs> guess we're just going to go right into this. Healing visualization. Okay, why don't we start with some nice deep diaphragmic breathing. So we're going to put our hands right here. Under our, just right over top of our rib cage, pushing our hands out with our breath. Okay, and through the nose. Out through the mouth. If you can, longer on the out breath. Take a nice deep breath. Okay. Now, I want you to just see yourself walking along a beautiful beach and you can feel the sand beneath your toes you don't have any shoes on and it's a beautiful sunny day it's warm the sun is glowing down on you you're wearing a flowing gown a really comfortable cotton gown is blowing in the breeze and as you stand there if you're a man you're just wearing a pair of shorts and you just feel really cool and the breeze is blowing your shorts. And if you're a woman, you can feel your dress just blowing in the wind. The sun is sparkling down on the water. And it just looks like rivulets of gold and light moving along the water in beautiful candescent glory, sparkling with diamonds. And you're just marveling at the light and how it dances with the water. And you can see the trees that are just above the shore. They're beautiful willow trees. And they have really, really long, long branches that actually reach all the way to the ground. And you just imagine yourself as you're walking, you just feel yourself strong like the willow. You feel yourself that you're not sort of rigid. You're, you're moving like the willow. You're flowing with life like the willow. And you actually see yourself now as the willow. And you see yourself tall with your roots going down into Mother Earth, grounded and sure and true with her. And she's holding you and telling you, I'm here for you. I provide for you. And I've been created for you by God. And I will be here for you. And you just resonate with the frequency that Mother Earth is vibrating at, the frequency of love, the frequency of peace, the frequency of contentment in understanding your purpose and your place on this earth with your feet firmly on the ground, with your roots going down firmly into the center of Mother Earth. And drawing up that energy of love, that energy of peace, that energy of healing, that energy of white, light, white, light, white, light. And that white light permeates your body. And you feel the light coming down from heaven, from your heavenly father and your heavenly mother and your savior, Jesu Christo. And you see the angels surrounding you with their light and they're, they're, holding their hands at you right now like this. And they're just saying, we love you, dear one. Let go of fear. Let go of doubt. Let go of worry. Let go of concern for tomorrow, for I care for the sparrows and I will care for you. And I am always here for you. And as they put their hands like this, just around you, you can see and feel the light from them penetrating you. And it comes in in all different colors, pink, golden, yellow, orange, magenta, purple. And all these beautiful, beautiful lights are just coming in and healing your organs, healing your body systems, healing all your chakras, healing your nervous system, resetting your brain and your body system so that you can function in optimal healing and we 
just do a little bit of tapping, take a nice deep breath in through the nose. And you're just releasing anything that's not in full alignment with your purpose, your mission, your value, your goodness, your divine design, your divine soul that is eternal, your divine mission on the earth. And you release all the shadow of yourself and others. You forgive yourself. You forgive others. You're able to set clear, healthy lines in the sand that do not deviate to protect your peace, to guard your peace, and to prepare yourself to see the Lord again so that you can say that you have completed your work on the earth and he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, for thou hast done good things in my vineyard. In Jesus' name, we call this forth, this blessing, this peace on us. And as we do, we just see ourselves walking, and there is another person walking with us, hand in hand with us. And it may be our Savior, it may be our guardian angel, it may be God the Mother, it may be God the Father. You decide. Your escort from heaven is there walking with you, holding your hand. And he or she looks into your eyes and says, it's time to let go. It's time to let go of the pain you've been carrying around. And you just say, what pain? And then all of a sudden you realize you've got this like, your, your shoulders are kind of like burnt from the chafing of this pack. And you don't even realize you have it, but it's like pulling your back far down. And all of a sudden you realize this pack has all these rocks in it that are from before. They're from other experiences that you don't even necessarily remember. But they're affecting you now in your life. And they're creating patterns that are not helping you to progress and complete your mission. So your escort says to you, you know, my dear, it's time to let go. It's time to let these go and I can help you. And you say, you can because I've tried to let go and I'm having a hard time. And your escort, in my case, is Jesus. He says, my beloved, give me your burdens and I will take them. I will make your burdens light. So you just slowly, you start taking these rocks out. You just take the whole pack off. You can't believe how, what a good feeling it is on your shoulders to have that heavy pack off. You kind of rub in your shoulders a little bit. And Christ is there. And you just go through and one by one, you just give him all the rocks till the pack is empty. And you just throw it on the ground because you don't actually need it anymore. And he looks at you and he puts his hands over your face like this. And he just says, very good, my child. You have let go of these burdens. Now you are free. And you smile and you just feel this burden lifted off your shoulders. And the angels come and they just infuse you with light and comfort and healing and understanding and all the physical, practical needs that you have, the mental needs, the emotional needs, the intellectual needs, the social needs are being met in this moment in one eternal round. And he's just laying his hands on your head and giving you all that you need to help yourself and to be able to receive that which is coming and flowing in from the divine design for your life. And you thank him for this blessing and he closes it and blesses you with everything you stand in need of at this time. And when you are finished you give him a big hug and he tells you it won't be long till you see him again and he kisses you on the cheek and it's the kiss of life and you can feel that kiss of life on your cheek and it's like something has changed in you and you just you say goodbye and you walk home on the uh on the sandy beach and you can feel your feet touching 
the sand, but this time it feels different. Every little grain of sand, you just feel such joy at the touch to your feet and the sensation. And it's just, everything is so special and beautiful and it takes on more vivid colors and more vivid sounds. The waves lapping up on the ocean, the sun glistening on the water just starts to break into thousands of uh, crystals, rainbow crystals all over the all over the beautiful ocean water. And the sun in the sky has big circles of rainbow light around it also. And you just know that something's different. And you realize that your shoulders don't hurt anymore. And the the wounds that you had on your shoulders from carrying all the burdens are healed. And you smile and you give thanks. And you just give yourself a big hug and you know that you're ready to walk into a home of peace where you create love and light and goodness. And, and you lay down on the grass, on the um, sand, and you just put your feet in the water. And look out at the sun. Take a nice deep breath. Just to integrate that. I'm just gonna tap my heart in the front and in the back, and releasing all heart walls and heart wounding, and bringing in peace and softness and acceptance, and just allowing that healing to come. In Jesus' name, Amen. So be it. So it is. There it is. We did it. <laughs> These are good for me. I find they're really helpful for me. I don't know what I'm going to say at all. And then I just start going and it's healing me as I'm helping others. So praise God. Bless you. Hope you're well. We're at 131.33. Um, transport guideline. I thought I would read a little bit out of this for us today. This is the plan, planned out of hospital birth transport guideline. And this is made by, prepared by Moz, which is the Midwives Association of Washington State. Okay. I'm just going to go in here. And I'm just going to read one quote, okay, from this. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm just going to, maybe a couple little things, okay. Although some out-of-hospital del deliveries are attended by certified nurse midwives, the vast majority in Washington state are attended by licensed midwives. Most licensed midwives in the state have completed two years of prerequisites followed by a three-year program, which includes relevant curriculum, nursing skills, and attendance at 100 births prior to passing an examination provided by North America Registry of Midwives, or NARM, N-A-R-M, as well as an additional test specific to Washington state practice issues. Licensed midwives are regulated under the RCW 1850 and usually have independent practices attending deliveries in home and or freestanding birth centers. Licensed midwives are authorized to obtain and administer the following. Okay, I'm just going to read what medications. Antibiotics for interpartum GBS prophylaxis per current CDC guidelines. This is for the moms, okay? Anti-hemorrhagic anti drugs to control postpartum hemorrhage. And there's a new one that I don't have the details here on. Um, my friend uh, Elaine Arnold told me about it. I'm not familiar with it, but the ones we used to have were oxytocin, mesoprostol, methergen, and hibibate, hemibate, sorry, hemibate. Local anesthetic for perineal repair, terbutaline for pending transport. That means we would transport if we used terbutaline to stop a premature labor. Epinephrine, also pending transport, that we would use that on a mother if she was having an, an anaphylactic shock or some kind of a allergic reaction. Magnesium sulfate, also pending transport. That would be for uh, preeclampsia or eclampsia. An MMR vaccine or Rogam. 
And then for newborns, newborn eye ointment, newborn vitamin K injection, and um, there's also injections that um, some midwives do, which is the hepatitis B injections. Okay. Now the indications for transport, this is kind of an important part of the document, I think, because it basically talks about all the different things that, you know, you might transfer, transfer care for, okay, or transport into the hospital for. The Washington state law that governs the practice of midwifery states that it shall be the duty of a midwife to consult with a physician whenever there are significant deviations from normal in either the mother or the infant. That's, that's right. That's why midwifery care is for the normal parameter, not for the outside normal range. But what are some things that could be things that we would transfer care for? Okay, let's go through. What are they? Indications for intrapartum trans transfers are, here we go, failure to progress in first stage, failure to progress in second stage, pain relief, sometimes just pain relief, we transport in, yeah. Maternal exhaustion, malpresentation, thick meconium, sustained fetal distress. Now we, st we don't differentiate anymore, thick, of course, thick is going to be one of those things that you're much more wanting to go in if it's thick. If it's thin, then you might make different decisions, but technically they're both the same from the way I was taught. Okay. Sustained fetal, uh, or they can act the same. Okay. They can do the same thing. Sustained fetal distress. But just to give you an FYI, if a baby's going to have meconium aspiration, they will most of the time already have it inside the womb, not right at the introitus. We used to like hold the baby's head there and suction really, really well. We wouldn't let the baby deliver till we had fully suctioned. But the truth is that they don't aspirate there. They aspirated already if they're aspirating. Uh, sustained fetal distress, the baby's condition, whatever that could be, general thing. Prolonged or premature rupture of membranes, placenta abruption, that's when the placenta comes away before it's supposed to, and it can cause massive hemorrhage and it's life, it can be life and death for mom and baby. Or placenta previa, where the placenta is very low and there could be bleeding at the delivery because of that. Hemorrhage, preeclampsia or hypertension, cord prolapse, I went through that in the last video, how to manage a cord prolapse. Breach delivery. So those are the reasons in intrapartum that some of the reasons that we were transferring. So that's all I'm going to do for that today. Yay. We're getting it. <laughs> we're getting down there. <laughs> I'm almost done on my list. How's everybody doing today? Hope you're well. Okay, I think I have, whoopsie. I have the sanitation kits and the um, affirmations and that's all we have left. So I just wanna show you this one little picture. And this is a quote from Ina May. From Spiritual Midwifery, a book I highly recommend. Well, actually, no, this is a quote from Valerie Hall. No, it isn't. She presented this particular section. That's what it is. <laughs> okay, when a child is born, the entire universe has to shift to make room. Another entity capable of free will and therefore capable of becoming God has been born. How insightful. Is that Ina May Gaskin? Yes. Pushing, let go of control. Let go and let God. Let go. Trust yourself. Trust the mother to do this important work. Trust the process God created. Accept changes.
that come with labor. The only thing that you can control is yourself and your attitude. I find birth as a metaphor for life so well. That's Isn't that beautiful? The only thing you can control is yourself and your own attitude. It's so true, isn't it? So um, Susa Gates Young said, I disciplined my taste, my desires, and my impulses, severely disciplining my appetite, my tongue, my acts, and how I prayed. I feel like self-mastery is a lot about habits and self-discipline. I really do. Be the calm in the eye of the storm. This calmness of spirit will affect the atmosphere in the room. Yes. Okay, we have affirmations and then our sanitation kits. And we're almost done. Thank you, everybody, for joining me, Colin the Midwife. I hope you're well. Thank you for coming on. I'm going to just make up some affirmations because I can't find my little book I was going to use. Okay, here we are. I'm going to make up some affirmations. Dear Father, what do we need? Dear Mother, what do we need today? I am peaceful. I am happy now that I am confident and self-assured and that I understand my place and my purpose on this earth. I am content with the goodness and the abundance that flows into my life on a day-to-day -day basis. I love all the amazing people in my life, David, Kevin, James, Edward, and many, many more who love me and are kind and good to me. I know that I am progressing in my life and that as I progress, I will find more and more healing, more and more wellness in each and every day. In each and every way, in each and every way, every day, I'm feeling better and better. In every way, I am just feeling more and more wonderful every day. And I understand my emotions. I'm able to accept my emotions. I'm able to release shame. I'm able to release blame. I'm able to release all habits that are not conducive to peace and love and healing and wholeness. I release all generational patterns of responding or tri being triggered. I release all traumatic stored events or stored trauma in my body, mind, heart, aura, or any parts of me from this life or any previous um, ex estates. And I call forth healing into my body, my mind, my social circles. And I ask for a special healing upon all those who are listening to this right now, that they will be affirmed for who they are, for their goodness, for their intrinsic worth as a daughter or son of God, that they will have a special feeling today of peace in this moment, that they will be able to release the past, release worry about the future and live in the present moment and the power of this one moment now and feel the love of God surrounding them, the love of angels surrounding them, the love of their higher self and of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, permeating outward into their heart space and into their... Let's just take another couple deep breaths. We'll just see the air going in through your heart and expanding your heart to love to feel the love, to release anything that isn't love, anything that's shadow or dark, without shame, without regret, without blame, just knowing that everything is for your good, everything is for your experience. All opposition that you've endured or been part of is all part of your school of learning on this earth. And we just release anything that's still in us, we allow it to come out like the, we see the air. It might be murky. We just we let anything be released through the air. And we call forth peace through the air into our whole bodies. And we just allow that air to go in, 
And we cast out all that is no longer needed. And just let that air to go into our whole entire body, healing, clearing, sealing up any portals, sealing up any tears in our auras or in our emotional bodies, resetting our nervous system, resetting all body systems, reducing and releasing all fear, replacing it with peace, understanding and confidence and confidence and self-worth and self-esteem that is healthy and pure and good. In Jesus' name, amen. So be it. There it is. <laughs> done. Affirmations done. Check. <laughs> I love it. It just turned into a prayer, so I'm just going with it. Okay. I know I've talked to you about the basic sanitation kit. I'm not going to go over that again, but I'm going to go over the potty bucket, the dishwashing basin kit, and the clothes washing kit. <laughs> this is your favorite part. <laughs> it's one of my favorite parts is being prepared physically to help people. It's so nice to be able to help people when they need food or clothing or shelter or support. Okay. I mean, what I teach really helps you to be able to help them emotionally and, you know, without fear. But also, I think having the physical things, the actual items, is really good, too. So the potty bucket. Ready? Let's do this. Five-gallon bucket times two. So you need two buckets. One pool noodle from the dollar store. Plastic bags. Spray cleaner. Rags times two and our paper towels. Toilet brush. Vinegar for cleaning. Baking soda and Ajax or Ajax in a Ziploc bag for cleaning. And what you do is you cut the pool noodle halfway through to the hole in the middle, and then you put the pool noodle around the toilet and it makes a seat so that can become a toilet. And then just put the plastic bags in there and it can become a portable toilet. Now the dishwashing basin kit has two wash basins, two dishcloths, two scrubbers, plain or soap filled, dish soap, gloves, kitchen gloves, two dish towels, and they can be cut from larger used towels. So you, if you have larger used towels, you can cut those up as dish towels. Okay, one more kit, ready? <laughs> one more kit. <laughs> Here we are. Another affirmation that I like to say, I will find a peaceful, safe, healing place to land. Father and mother are my witnesses. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. The clothes washing kit. This is our very last thing on our list. So thanks for joining me. We're at 147. We've passed 144. The 144 is past 144 <laughs> on our timing. <laughs> okay, here we are. Clothes washing kit. Clothes pins, rope, large laundry soap, sunlight, fells nafta is available. Sunlight and fells nafta are both available at Walmart or at Brolims. Five gallon bucket times two or two basins. Okay, that's it. I'll do one more quote out of this book, okay? Let's see. <clears throat> okay, so we're one of the, she has different stages of healing, and one of the stages is restoration. I am being restored to my full health. I am being restored to my full mental, emotional, and physical health. What was taken from me is being restored. So these are the things that she says about that. She says, restoration should come at a time when it can be life-giving, not overwhelming. So it takes time and you need to make restoration as you're able to and you know, here are some of the things. Enjoyment of holidays, vacations, and other celebrations. A lot of these things are just not part of your life when you're with someone that's abusive. 
financially financial stability paying off debts and increasing savings yes these are all things we can do to help ourselves recover after abusive relationships or even when we're in them still restoration of physical health enjoying consistent energy levels reduction in body pain and all other ailments yes most people in abusive relationships with unconscious you know what i would say unconscious um disordered narcissists which is a lot of people actually now i believe most of them undiagnosed um you know when you're when you're being abused and you're being manipulated you barely know it but it affects your health it affects your body it affects your mind it affects everything you start having like pain somatic pain everywhere that no one can understand no doctors can find the reasons for it that's what happens when you're abused okay um restoration of emotional well-being living free or significantly reduced levels of anxiety worry and depression yes those are the things that come when you're in those relationships is massive depression isolation and anxiety and insomnia and a lot of other things replacement of material items that were destroyed or stolen during the abuse yes hopefully this is all coming for a lot of people and i know some people have already been through it and um, yes i think a lot of people are in the place where they're ready to have their lives restored to them i know i am yes i am okay well i think that's everything i think we went, got through it all hope you're well uh it's been a pleasure to be here with you today and talk with you. And um, yeah, I'm happy that I can continue this. Looking forward to my friend Abril and James coming today for dinner and uh, David's cooking. <laughs> so we're going to have a nice Shabbat. And um, yeah. I'm happy I could share a few little tidbits of information with you. Hope you're collecting your supplies and um, have a blessed week. Shabbat Shalom from Charlene. Bye, everybody. Thank you.